All right. Well, why don't we um, get started and maybe we can just introduce the project team. I know we have, I think, uh, too many folks to do full introductions, but um, why don't I, I just go through and um, and introduce everybody um, that involved today from the project team. So um, my name is Gary Simonson. Uh, I'm a senior planner with PSRC, and I'm the project manager for this safety action plan. Um, Kelly, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? We'll go, we'll go through PSRC first. <clears throat> sure. Hi, everyone. Kelly McGurdy, Director of Transportation Planning at PSRC. Thank you, Kelly. Craig? Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Craig Hellman. I'm the director of the data group here at PSRC. Thank you. Uh, ben? Good morning. Uh, ben McKenta, director of regional planning. Thank you. And um, and then maybe we'll shift over to the project team. Uh, so, um, Andrew, go ahead, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew Kapitz. I'm WSP's National Highway Safety Practice Lead. And I'm happy to join everyone here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mike? Hi, everybody. Um, with WSP, I'm a uh, data scientist here in Seattle. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Jeannie? Hi, Jeannie Agutanza, and I'm leading this uh, PSRC the safety team. And we just have one more person, Greg Mallon. Yep. Greg, and then I think we're good to go. Hi, go there. ahead, Greg. Okay. Do you want to introduce yourself, Greg, just briefly? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I just got my audio, my audio going here. So oh, sorry. Good. Hey there, my name is Greg Mallon. I'm on the consultant side at WSP, working on the Puget Sound Regional Council Safety Action Plan. So I'll be doing the screen share today and probably go on mute shortly after. Thanks. Perfect. Well, Greg, go ahead. Feel free to so actually. Actually, maybe I'll just go through the agenda briefly here, and then I'll turn it over to you to share your screen. So. Um, so we're going to start off today by just talking about um, what a high injury, net, a high injury network is, what the, what it typically includes, um, what they're used for, what some of the key sort of variables and differences and levers, um, so to speak, um, that are involved in the high injury network. Uh, then PSRC um, uh, is going. We're going to our project team is going to discuss. Um, how we developed our high injury network. We have a, a short demonstration. We're going to hand it off uh, then to uh, a couple of our lo local agencies. We have Kent um, as well as um, Everett that will be presenting um, briefly on the work that they're doing. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll open it up for other any other folks that want to discuss um, work that they're doing um, and then we'll we're gonna sort of finish with a, a discussion, uh, sort of a conversation about what the right level of what we think the right level of consistency uh, across high injury networks in the region is. So with that, um, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Greg. And Andrew is gonna walk us through this uh, first uh, piece of the uh, agenda. Thanks, Gary. Sharing. Okay, just went over the agenda, and here you are. Thanks. Um, so as Gary pointed out, we wanted to talk about what uh, the perception of a high injury network is, uh, you know, how it fits into the scheme of things, and, you know, some differences and things that we found from working on other ones across the country. So at the highest level, you know, the high injury network is really, it's, it, it's being developed in this case to help comply with the safety analysis requirement of USDOT's safety action plan for the ss for program. Um, there are other uses for it naturally. You may have your own use for your, for your local agency. There are different ways of developing one, um, different variables that be, could be inclu included or considered, uh, but there are some key differences as well. And as Barry pointed out, we wanted to talk through some of those high level considerations and then Mike's gonna run through a demonstration of how the HIN was developed with the SRC. So at its core, a high injury network is some collection of roadways or intersections that are, had crashes. And those crashes generally resulted in serious injuries or fatalities within that given road. Um, you know, when you think about it, you know, there are some different questions about what to include. And we'll, we'll talk about that. But the perception here is that um, for this case, because of its focus on uh, vision zero, 
And, uh, you know, the really the core of what we're trying to do here is one that's focusing on serious injuries and fatalities. So it just there's some common terms that, that we might be using, you know, in the documentation as you move through and look through what PSRC has developed and what Microsoft is going to demonstrate. The roadway network is kind of that collection of roadways considered in the HIN. It, then the high injury network is that subset of roadways that have the crashes be considered. That roadway network may not be every roadway within the region. And as you'll see in this case, it's not. And there were some reasons that that was determined to be the best case or the best scenario for working forward here. Um, the HIN is crash-based. It's used using historical crash information in lots of ways. Um, but primarily, it's these days, it's kind of distilled down into frequency per mile or KSI, killed or serious injured by some unit. And there are reasons for doing that. Other agencies may have more detail and more information to be able to include things like uh, volumes or, or different crash considerations or weighting or things like that. But in this case, as Michael demonstrate, you know, the determination was that within roadways in question, the, the common denominator was fatal and serious injury crashes. And so that's the one that's being used. Other HINs may just look at crash density. So just the quantity of crashes in a given area. Um, there can be weighting applied, like we said. Now, some cases will apply different weights to fatal or serious injury or lower injury severities. Some will use crash costs in order to weight the crashes, like from um, the National Safety Council or local or state crash costs that are used in order to kind of determine the severity of crashes for a benefit cost ratio. Um, there are lots of ways of prioritizing things. Uh, I would like to point out that by its nature, though, high injury networks do involve injury crashes. So, best practice really would be to exclude any non injury crash at a minimum. So, no property damage only crashes. High injury networks are not predictive tools. They're not used to identify future crash locations in the sense that they, they're not a highly safety manual analysis. They're not an empirical Bayesian analysis of, of, of regression of where crashes may occur. Um, they don't look to the future because they're not predictive in nature. They're purely using crash data in this case that have happened in the past. So why are they developed? Well, they are a data-driven approach to help agencies identify those patterns and hotspots of traffic-related injuries and fatalities. You know, a lot of agencies or a lot of the public will often say, we can't do this. We'll never be able to figure out where our concerns are or how to distill it down. And by geospatially plotting out the crashes, we can start figuring out where these crashes are occurring. So the HINs are tied to real locations. They're, they're tied to real roadways and within the network. And again, it's that term used to describe that subset of roadways that have historically experienced the most severe crashes. Depending on the, the size of the area being analyzed or the number of crashes in an area, there, there may be different considerations. Um, what would be included, what the thresholds are, um, how many roadways, the classification of roadways, the severity of crashes. But ultimately, it's been used to help prioritize those locations that have shown historically experienced more crashes. Uh, it really does help fulfill that requirement of safety analysis for the SSA program. We talked about variables. Um, at a minimum, they have to include a roadway network or some subset of roadways within the area being looked at and be able to quantify the crashes that have occurred. So there needs to be some amount of crash data. And there could be different filters that are applied to prioritize based on crash severity or you know, most will focus on serious injuries or fatal crashes. As I mentioned, you know, depending on the frequency of crashes, if your jurisdiction has fewer crashes, which is a good thing, and then you may need to include lesser severity crashes to really help stratify the network and figure out what locations may really rise to the top. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk a little bit more about how PSRC developed their high injury network. Uh, and for the discussion, of course, of you know, some of the differences that you may experience for your local ones as well. Yeah, so um, uh, like what Andrew just said, I'm going to give a overview of the uh, high injury network that we developed for PSRC. I'll talk about some of the inputs that go into uh, developing our uh, this high injury network that you're looking at. And then I'll actually give a little demo of um, how, again, we kind of come to what you're looking at here. So this image is uh, an image of the high injury network that we developed for PSRC. Uh, the high injury sections are colored in red. And what you'll see underneath it is kind of actually kind of the base network that we use, which is the regionally significant um, network links uh, for PSRC. Uh, 
what we effectively do, and I'll give you a little, little background of the process, is that we ingest a network um, of network links, uh, and we break those up into 10 meter segments. Um, so along all blue lines here, again, we segmentize uh, each of those links. And for each 10 meter segment, given uh, the crashes that are uh, locally that ha happen uh, around that, that 10 meter segment, we'll create these crash estimates, the density estimates. So killed or seriously injured uh, persons per mile. Um, once we have those estimates along the entire uh, network layer, we then do a level of post-processing where we then begin to take away uh, uh, segments that either have uh, low uh, injury estimates um, or maybe they don't meet some sort of criteria as in like a percentile rank. So once we do that, we develop again, these red sections, which represent the really bad um, or uh, uh, corridors where there is a significantly high number of um, uh, accidents that occur, again, based off of that uh, killed or seriously injured per mile estimate that we're calculating. Uh, what we do then provide is this data, both tabularly uh, and in uh, a spatial format, um, and we also do provide a number of uh, interactive kind of web tools that allow us, as well as PSRC, to investigate this work, uh, quality control it, and again, do this kind of um, uh, post-processing exercise where we include or exclude locations. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we'll talk about just a little bit about the um, kind of basic inputs that we require to perform this operation. Uh, we need two inputs. Uh, first, a network layer. So, um, oh, excuse me, I'll say uh, the crash layer. So uh, for our, uh, for this exercise, for the PSRC high injury network, we use the watchdog crash data. This is point data uh, representing crash locations. Um, and with crash locations, we know the number of uh, killed or seriously injured, uh, uh, you know, injuries per each of those. Um, we also then require a second uh, input, which is a network layer. And again, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we use the PSRC uh, regional network. Again, these are roadways that are regionally significant um, to uh, the PSRC um, area. Uh, this includes uh, arterial, state routes, uh, freeways. Um, and, and again, just to draw your attention to the image to the right, blue, blue lines indicate those regionally significant uh, network links that we used for this particular uh, process. Um, and you can see uh, the dots uh, represent the crash locations. Uh, uh, purple dots indicate locations that were on uh, the network when we performed um, this iteration of this process. Uh, pink were excluded either because they were not KSI uh, type cr crashes, or they just weren't uh, close enough in terms of uh, the buffering of, of um, uh, the PSR regional network. So that's a little bit about the inputs and the overview. I'm just going to go into a quick demo um, of how we do that. Um, and I'm going to now share my screen if that's all right. Bear with me for two seconds. Okay, so hopefully it came up. Uh, what you should be looking at is an interactive web tool that we've developed. It looks like uh, Mike, we're not. No, I, okay. Let me just. We're not me, seeing it yet. Let me see. How about now? Yes. Now we see it. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, we are looking at an interactive web tool uh, dashboard that we use um, to develop what we just uh, talked about: um, the PSRC high injury network. Um, what you can see here is I'm going to zoom in a little bit to North Seattle if my uh, cursor, if my computer wakes up. So uh, what you can see here is that we've already done a little bit of pre-processing, but for, again, uh, you're looking at 10 meter segments uh, in their KSI estimates uh, for every roadway um, in the uh, PSRC area. Blue lines, again, indicating uh, regionally significant roads that we actually perform this operation on. Uh, the red locations, kind of pink to red, again, are um, uh, high injury uh, 
10 meter segments that we've already uh, begun to start our processing on. Um, we use this tool to include or exclude, uh, again, these 10 meter segments um, to the high injury uh, network. Um, so we can see here that uh, if we start interacting with some of these sliders, we can see that um, locations that have a low uh, injury density um, begin to melt away, uh, highlighting the locations that where a high number of injuries have occurred. Um, we can alternatively start to interact with this uh, and begin to remove uh, locations based off of percentile rank. Uh, this map actually already has a base filter of 80% on, uh, in the, which is pretty common in, in the literature. Um, but if you wanted to inc uh, increase this uh, value and only look at locations uh, that are of the most, um, the most serious locations, we, you can increase this to upwards to 90%. And you can start seeing that uh, locations that are very dangerous for road users begin to pop, really. Um, for example, if you look here, this is Aurora. Uh, this location in particular has uh, 29 um, killed or seriously in, kill, killed or seriously injured uh, persons per mile. That's in the 95th percentile. Again, um, this tool is made uh, for both uh, our purposes to um, Kind of again quality control and explore uh, the data after it's been developed, but also uh, for um, clients to interact and kind of prioritize what they think uh, their high entry network um, should look like. Again, we provide uh, a number of different dials and toggles. Um, if we wanted to prioritize only very long, hot, contiguous high entry sections, we can do that by turning off uh, some of these filters for the lower or the, the lower end in terms of the length of corridors, um, which can be very useful. And again, in if if uh, one wants to uh, prioritize kind of longer corridors um, or corridors that have an, a higher average uh, uh, injury density. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's uh, we can wrap that up for the demo. Uh, and I will stop sharing my screen. I think Greg will take it back over. Yeah, and um, just just to recap, so uh, after the demo, just we wanted to show um, some of the options that we had chosen uh, for um, the final development of the PSRC high injury network. Um, first and foremost, again, we've only used uh, fatally and seriously um, injured participants. Um, so uh, locations or crashes were excluded if um, uh, there weren't serious injuries that were accrued at, during that that incident. Um, we provided uh, we we initiated a 85th percentile just kind of cut off uh, off the bat. Um, including you know, going down to uh, anything kind of lower than that, you just include uh, a lot of um, roadway segment uh, uh, that, that you then have to kind of sift through. Uh, the, the 85th percentile includes about 20% of uh, the roadways of the base network. Um, additionally, we apl applied a 100 meter kind of minimum for those contiguous high injury corridors. Uh, we did this for a couple of different reasons. Um, it first assured that uh, we just weren't looking at specific intersections. We wanted to look at, again, corridors uh, with high incident rates. Um, additionally, if a, a base corridor is very small, like it's just a very uh, short um, segment, uh, then uh, uh, mathematical issues can uh, arise um, if there's only uh, one crash, uh, but it's very short. Again, if you get in, uh, if you calculate the estimate of KSI per mile, it can artificially inflate that um, that value. So we try to avoid that uh, using um, that filter. And then lastly, we uh, applied a filter where we yeah. needed a minimum of 
uh, to KSI for all um, high injury contiguous segments, just assuring that there was actually um, uh, multiple uh, occurrences, a higher frequency of the crash type that we were interested in. And Mike, can you also just um, note which years of data were used? Yes, uh, last five. So uh, 2016, 2017, 2018, I think up to 2021. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, it might be, set. sorry, it might be 17 to 2022. I can check on that, but uh, yeah. And Mike, let me, um, this is Craig, let me add one other thing. If people were looking at the, the screen, I see Kim has a, a question too, but I just want to highlight um, there's going to be an update to our high injury network. Um, you may have noticed as uh, Mike was scrolling around um, that the interstates didn't show up. Um, that was actually, um, we're going to go through and add the intersections and applying the same criteria to it. Um, so we'll actually have a revised high injury network um, coming out. So this is a draft. I just wanted to, to flag that now, just in case people are wondering as you're looking like, why are there no freeways there? There were some technical things as we were working through to do it. So we're going to work through and get those added in that meet these kind of same criteria. So. Perfect. Kim, do you, you, you have a quick question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering if there was any consideration of using um, roadway volumes such as VMT or um, total number of vehicles, um, the including vehicle volume data is pretty standard for calculating crash rates along corridors. We're noticing in Kirkland, there's a, quite a lot of difference between the high injury network this high injury network and the ones that we've put together. Granted, the, the data is a little, the years are a little different, but um, I'm wondering if there's consideration of that and and how we, and then maybe a farther conversation down the line is how we might kind of utilize our local data as well. I'm curious about that. It seems pretty standard to include volume data when doing this type of analysis. Craig or Mike, do you guys? Uh, I'll, I'll actually take that. Or um, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the reason that it wasn't used in this case was because um, it was. This is essentially a first pass or screening tool in order to identify those locations of major concern. As I said, it's it's not a predictive method. It's not looking at forecasting. It's not trying to reduce regression to the mean. It's really starting to hone in on locations of corridors of concern. Um, the other initial reason that the volumes weren't initially considered were because for many of the roadways, especially if we started getting down to lower local roadways, volumes were just simply aren't available on a lot of, on a lot of those, those local lower classification or lower roadway categories. That's not to say you can't use that and use it as a consideration for an HIM if you have that level of data. It was just to determine that for you know this first pass in order for the level of effort involved, um, that that amount of data wasn't going to be necessarily available. Um, the other reason was, you know, for because it does the volumes depending on how we calculate. When we start getting into really short segments, we started getting some really wonky numbers. Um, you know, when, uh, when when normalized over a short length, um, that was the reason, for instance, that the uh, one thousand meter or six tenths of a mile roughly corridor was chosen. Sort of to help kind of smooth out some of those spikes, so we didn't start getting really short segments that may have had experienced very high number of crashes. That when divided out by length or mile. Um, we're, we're getting really, really high unrealistic numbers. So again, that's, you know, we're, we're going to talk about that and some of the differences. And it, that's not to say that using volume is not a good thing um, or a perfectly acceptable thing. It just wasn't used for this particular one. Great. Thank you, Andrew. I, I do notice, I notice we have several other folks raising their hands and we absolutely want to address your questions. I think just for the sake of, um, let's, we have a discussion section at the end. Um, and we can maybe it would make more sense to address the questions uh, at that time. So if you want to um, feel free to type them into the chat or just um, raise your hand again when we get to the end, um, whatever your, your preference is, and we will make sure to get to that. Um, so I continue, or, or I guess, um, Andrew, you're picking it up here, right? 
Yeah, that was a great introduction. And we wanted to talk about, um, again, some of the differences that people may experience and why things may be inconsistent. And this is not a complete list. It's, you know, some things that were raised clearly um, as we were going through this and then talking with other people as well. So why HINs can be different, um, they consider different roadways. Depending on jurisdictions, you know, as pointed out, it, uh, the classification of roadways or the, the level of uh, functional class included may be different. Smaller jurisdictions may have information, have data, and be able to consider all the way down to that local neighborhood, local roadway level. Uh, in some cases, uh, jurisdictions have made the decision to analyze but not necessarily include state routes, for instance, because they may not have the ability to easily implement changes. So they're trying to focus on those roadways that they have greater control over in order to affect project or change. So um, years of data. Uh, you guys have pointed out as well, the years of crash data analysis could absolutely have an impact on what ultimately becomes part of a high injury network. Uh, the, the years, the quantities of crashes, the, the crash severity that are included, uh, if we go down to um, lower severity crashes, you know, including lower levels of injury than just fatal or serious injury, then more roadways or more crashes may be available to consider. Similarly, if there's some form of weighting used on the different levels of crashes. In this network, fatal and serious injury crashes were treated equally. Uh, but if you start including lower levels of some injury severity, such as uh, possible or minor injuries, there may be a reason to include those and weight those lesser than a fatal or a serious injury. So there are other networks that may look at, say, motorized crashes only. So they may focus on pedestrian or bicycle crashes. And that could also, of course, have an impact on what roadways are considered within the high three. It's not to say anyone is better or different or better or worse uh, or right or wrong, just that there are different ways of creating this HI. Perfect. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so um, now we are going to shift over uh, and hear from some of our local jurisdictions that are developing high injury networks and uh, hear their approaches. So why don't we start with Kent? Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, David Payne. Gary, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Can I share screens? Is that unlocked? Should have uh, sharing privileges. Is it? Is it letting awesome. you? <clears throat> share. Yeah. Right screen. Come on. Here we go. Okay, so I've got three slides. Sorry to, uh, <laughs> to know ahead of time. Um, but really happy to be able to share the city's high injury network efforts. Um, uh, similar to the discussion that uh, was just uh, laid out, we we opted to go with a five year period uh, to be consistent with uh, Washington State, uh, Washington Traffic Safety Commission, WashDOT, uh, Local Road Safety Plan, and AASHTO. Uh, so we've got um, the, here's our our local uh, locally identified high injury network so uh, using a similar. David, I'm, I'm not seeing if you're, I'm, and I apologize, if you've meant to already share your screen. Um, oh, there we go. How about that? Well, Perfect. Everything else went yeah. blank. So we'll, <laughs> great. So here we go. Uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's actually a screenshot. It's an image that we took from one of our engagement events. Uh, so you get to see the unfiltered comments that were written on there, uh, the feedback that we've been given, including some locations from some of the folks who are participating. Uh, so we went with five years, similar to the the risk, not sorry, not the risk, not a Bayesian step, the um, where the crash densities are. So that and that's so that we can have multiple uh, purpose with this type of analysis to be eligible for WashDOT grants, local road safety plan conversation. Um, the the second uh, item is is um, you know we've we've been getting feedback on uh, on the solution types uh, or from our outreach and engagement um, had uh, <laughs> had quite a few comments um, and so we've, we're getting feedback on the types of solutions that are um, that are identified in the crash types so for the common contributing crash factors there are certain solution types I think uh, y'all are familiar with those so we've been getting feedback from folks on on what what they support, what they'd like to see more of, and we'll be able to loop that into the plan. Um, and then the other aspect of of the high injury network, at least in in, in Kent, is a, a lot of the roads because you know we've been 
we've been fortunate to go through a, a local road safety plan cycle uh, a couple of times. Uh, a number of these segments already have projects uh, either on the ground or in development. Uh, and so it, this allows us the opportunity to talk about those too. Um, so you can see some of the, the call outs uh, in the engagement materials where we talk about where we talk about those. Uh, so that's the, um, and then a little preview of, uh, I think this might get back to um, Kim's question about um, about risk. And I know different communities are choosing different words, different wording uh, as it regards to the risk factors, um, because we're all in a very litigious um, litigious environment. And I appreciate, uh, and we appreciate PSRC, including the section 407 disclaimer information online. Um, so we've taken the high injury networks and then identified the common risk factors within those particular areas and then projected them out onto corridors with similar elements, similar factors, uh, <laughs> highlights. It, again, we're, you know, we, we sort of struggle with that language too. Uh, and then that will inform what the, the bundles of solutions are, um, in the, in the plan. We hope to have that all wrapped up in a draft plan this winter. Great. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Um, now let's turn it over to uh, Corey. Are you going to be sharing uh, your screen for the uh, effort portion? Yeah, Gary. Um, Jade uh, is going to share her screen. If you could uh, make her a uh, presenter, that would be great. Oh, uh, okay. Um, that's possible. I can I can run the slide deck as well. Just uh, it might be easier at this point if just because we have you as the co-host, if you are able to run the slide deck, and then if Jade could maybe speak. Okay, to them, great, that would great. Probably be I'll do my best. Well, Gary, thank you, and uh, thank you everybody uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak. I'm Corey Hertz, City Traffic Engineer here in Everett. Uh, and project manager for our uh, Vision Zero Everett project. Um, so, you know, our consultant team is made up of uh, local firms, uh, Kimley Horn, DKS, and PRR, and we're working on our comprehensive safety action plan uh, to reduce serious injury and fatal crashes in Everett. Uh, most of you probably know that Everett's a city of about 110,000 people. Um, it's county seat of Snohomish County. And the city itself is long and thin. It's about nine miles long and four miles wide with a number of high volume, multi-lane, higher speed arterials, um, state routes like Highway 99 and uh, Highway 529 and Highway 527 run through Everett. Um, there's also a number of limited access facilities, uh, SR 526, the Boeing Freeway and I-5 that, um, that bisect Everett. And we've excluded that data uh, from our data set, any of the limited access facilities, and we've used a, a five-year time horizon as well. So um, like most people in the room, we've seen uh, an increase in crashes since 2012. Um, that's when about uh, everybody got a smartphone in their pocket and in their vehicles and uh, legalization of recreational use of marijuana um, became a thing. Um, since, the COVID, uh, since the COVID pandemic, we've seen um, an overall drop in, in crashes, but a, a, an increase in injury crashes like many people in this room. And so um, in, injury and fatal crashes, the predominant um, severe crash type in Everett, like many of us in this room is, is pedestrians. And it's a trend we are working to, um, uh, to reverse as part of our Vision Zero program. So um, what you're gonna hear today is uh, very new and in draft form. Uh, first time I saw this analysis was last week. And so we haven't even started our, our public outreach component, um, but uh, we, are, we are working on it. So, um, so right now I've asked uh, Jade Bozen, our transportation safety analyst from Kimley Horn to uh, do a quick run through and a few slides to discuss our, our methodology. So I'll see if I can get that slide deck up right now. Sorry about the dead air here. Okay. 
right? I think you guys ought to be able to see it. Yeah, we can see it. Yes. Take it away, Jade. Okay. So I really appreciate the conversation go like from the beginning because it'll really help with all the background on everything that we've done. Um, if you go to our next slide, we created um, a high injury, high risk network that's actually informed by three other kind of sub analyses that have already been um, touched on by some other groups. Um, let me see if I can change the next slide. I'm working on that, Jade, my apologies. No, you're all good. <laughs> I'm not. One moment, please. Yeah. Um, we also, we similarly have done um, five years worth of crashes in our analysis. And then one thing to kind of preface everything that we're about to show, um, our segments, we had broken down from roadway to roadway intersection. So it is a lot smaller blocks, but our goal there was um, if we knew certain corridors were an issue, we still wanted to find almost like the hotspots or kind of the worst of the worst areas in our roadway network. So these are the three components of our safety analysis that we've completed, um, a high crash network. So purely just um, frequency of crashes, which roadways have experienced more per mile, um, the high injury network. And then we've done an additional step. We've done a network screening that's outlined in the highway safety manual. And that's kind of more of a statistical model of crashes experienced on roadways. And all of that together kind of informs what we're referring to as a high risk network. So next slide. So this is our high crash network that we have. So still some small segments. That doesn't mean that you can't link them all together because it's probably an issue, but we just highlighted roadways on which 50% of all of our crashes within the last five years have occurred. So that's just a high crash network based on frequency and all severities. And then the next slide. So this is our high injury network. We did the same thing where we isolated fatal and serious injuries and then calculated a crash rate per mile based on those severe crashes. So the segments that you're seeing here also represent 50% of all of our fatal and serious injury crashes within the last five years. There's kind of some of those like small ones like to the north and to the east of Everett that are most likely just popping up because it's a short segment. So having a really, even if one fatal injury occurred on there, resulting in a really high crash rate per mile. And this is kind of where our data processing and post-processing is going to have to go through um, to eliminate some of those that don't make sense and link together some more identifiable corridors. And then our last slide. So this is a critical crash rate analysis. It compares subpopulations of roadways to one another. So this analysis does take into account um, volumes and functional class and all of that so that major collectors are only getting compared to major collectors. They're not equally, or they're not unequally weighted against like a local roadway or anything. This network only includes roadways that experienced three or more crashes. That was kind of one of the filters we applied on there. Um, and anything highlighted here is experiencing more crashes than we'd expect of that type of roadway. And then on the next slide, the same analysis we did for intersections as well. Um, we attributed crashes either to a roadway if it was within a per like a certain buffer, and then otherwise it was attributed to an intersection within 100 feet of that intersection. So left turning vehicles at a signal that isn't necessarily something we can mitigate on the roadway segment. We wanted to identify those intersections that had issues. So that's all of our analyses. And together, we just bring them all into one, into what we consider a high-risk network. So this network we have identified has some sort of safety need or some degree of safety need. And this is where we will be pulling potential project safety improvement um, locations for our SS4A. Excellent. Thank you, Jade. Um, great. So I think we're going to now move into the discussion portion. I do want, um, I was received via chat a couple of, I think what will be fairly quick questions um, for the PSRC team um, regarding just the uh, our um, high injury network. So the first question is from Sean 
Dolan with KPG. Um, and he asked, is the, the dashboard with the sliders of PSRC's HIN available online? Um, and I think the answer, Mike, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, that's actually um, an interactive web tool. It's a, just an HTML file. Um, so I believe that a version of that map is currently online, but if you wanted to actually use the web tool, it's pretty easy. You actually just send the file around how you would an Excel file or a PowerPoint file, and the user would just say, instead of opening, you know, in a... Um, uh, application that you have on your computer, you just say open via Chrome and it's just a web based browser. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't require, um, a, you know, a URL getting set up or anything like that. Uh, we like using these types of products because uh, I think it democratizes the process pretty well. Gary, um, I don't believe that that is available at the moment. Craig, help me out here, but I believe we said right now we have the static high injury network map, but when we release the plan for public comment, more of these tools will become available. Is that right? Correct. And and the reason for that, and we're happy to share stuff with folks, but it's it's not to confuse things. So as we work through with our team to de develop, you know, the, the segment lengths that we're considering, the percentiles, the thresholds that led into our high injury network which is currently available online um, and what you saw there was the the sausage making part it's the thing that we use to actually try to yeah. identify what that network was perfect thanks craig and kelly um so next question um is uh, can you confirm the this is from john vanderslice uh with king county can you confirm the unit of analysis is it at the crash level or the number of injuries slash fatalities. So Mike, if you want to jump in for that, I, I believe it's at the um, injuries fatalities level, but it if is. you confirm that. <laughs> it is, it's not yeah. the collisions, it's the yeah. injuries and fatalities, okay. Gary. Perfect. Um, and then um, from Victoria uh, Kovacs with City of Kirkland, uh, why did PSRC roadway segmentation not group by roadway characteristics such as number number of lanes or posted speed? And that's uh, going to be moving forward as we develop more into the, the predictive, the, the future, what we're calling the high-risk network. Again, this was clearly a crash-based network looking at which roadways have crashes within the time period being analyzed. Or more specifically, where fatal and serious injuries have occurred within the time period being analyzed. There's further work being done in order to look at those factors that were shown in some of the examples, um, roadway classification, number of lanes, different features which are known to contribute, and especially in this case, how to contribute to past crashes with the PSRC region. So there will be more variables and details included as we move forward into what's kind of being called more of a high-risk network uh, for, for future considerations. Great. And then a, another follow-up from John um, with King County. What's the total HIN length compared to the total network mileage? Mike, I think you have that number. I, I, I think the area being analyzed was, what, 93% of the roadways? Or, um, Mike, do you remember the, number, the statistic offhand? I, I, I don't I have, I, yeah, I, I believe the input layer was around... Um, Actually, I just have it somewhere. Sorry, let me just find it real fast. Um, and we could also always follow up with that. I, I worry a little bit about finding the number on the fly yeah. um, so that we don't don't confuse people. But I, I think that would probably be better if we just actually calculate that um, what that share is, um, if that's okay yeah. with folks. And I think, yeah. And so I'm going to, I'd like to shift the conversation since we have about 15 minutes left to the, the discussion of consistency, but I know you you guys have a lot of questions regarding um, the sort of the inner workings of the of the HIN network, and we absolutely want to address those. So uh, I'm going to ask the last one here that's online, um, but otherwise um, I'm, I'll put my um, email address um, in the chat here, um, and if folks can just send me um, any of those questions, I'll pass them along. Um, and we'll make sure to get those addressed. Um, so the last um, question um, 
will uh, address here is regarding the kind of the, the technical aspects is was speed considered higher speeds are going to lead to this is from Jason Kennedy uh, with the city of federal way higher speeds are going to lead to more serious injuries so how can we isolate that so the other factors that might have caused the serious injuries and not necessarily speed are identified yep just like volume number of lanes functional class um, those aren't directly used right now in the HIN. Um, I guess I'll think about class was in the sense that roadways within the network of concern were already kind of classified a bit. So it pulled out, say, like the local roadways and things. When moving forward and looking at roadways of significance for, for the, the, the higher risk network, um, I believe in, and I don't have it up, obviously, that speed was one of the factors that was considered close to speed or, or travel speed, depending on what data we had available. So a lot of these variables that people are raising are not included in the HIN right now, all being looked at for the high risk network moving forward. Perfect. Okay, so I just put my um, email address there. So like I said, any other technical questions, please do not hesitate, send them my way. Um, but I wanna make sure we have enough time to talk about this sort of consistency piece here. So I guess I'll open it up first. Does, that, does anyone have any um, thoughts or questions in terms of, um, you know, we, we've heard now, obviously, PSRC's approach. We've heard from a couple of local jurisdictions. I know many of you in attendance today are thinking about your approach for those who are developing a high injury network. Um, what is what are the uh, sort of thoughts um, or uh, that you have related to consistency? And and then we'll um, I, I'd like to hear from a couple of the uh, folks at PSRC uh, directors. I think have some have some thoughts on this as well. Um, so, uh, Lacey, uh, go ahead, please. Hi, everybody. Lacey Jane Wolf, City of Bellevue. Um, this is just such a great project, and thanks for bringing us all together to discuss. I really enjoyed, too, hearing about Kent's perspective and Everett's, and I know that there's many, many cities on here who each have done their own analyses and um, put together their own safety plans, which I just think is wonderful. I think what we're hearing from our elected officials in Bellevue is not an expectation that everybody approach safety the same way across four counties. I think that wouldn't make sense um, and heard that from a few other cities as well. But I think um, our elected officials feel that it's very, very important that the regional plan recognize and incorporate um, uh, locally identified safety priorities in terms of mapping. And so um, I think that having one consistent methodology across the whole four regions is so important and definitely is like a, a really key to help us see where are the problems happening and including, you know, on there in a different color or something, these different networks with a, a note saying these are, these are all developed differently, but here's kind of an overlay and a comparison I think will be really important as we move forward to toward finalizing the regional safety action plan. So that's it for me. Thanks for the opportunity. Great. Um, Kelly, go ahead. If I, if I could, so yeah. Lacey Jane, maybe, maybe we can chat with you um, in more detail, because just as you were saying that, I was trying to figure one map that includes 50 different individual maps or methodologies. So there might be some challenges there. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about how we can best um, incorporate and represent all of the different local methodologies and priorities. I think we just, not that we're not that we don't want to do that, but I can see that that could be a, a really challenging mapping layer. So we should talk more about that. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, Kelly. Great point. And again, just showing my bias of I'm used to looking at one little piece of the four county region and y'all are used to looking at the, the whole big picture. And so definitely hope we can collaborate to find something that works for everyone and and really helps our elected officials understand, you know, here are the regional areas and then also important are the locally identified ones. Great. That's a really good point. Um, and, and certainly for the, the broader the area, the more important that becomes to consider is that um, without selling crafts, the most important location for, for any particular municipality may unfortunately just not rise up to the top of a list of greater concerns when looking at a broader region. That doesn't diminish the importance of, of any location discussion within your local community. But clearly when you're looking at that broader area, if you're say looking at 10% of LU versus 
10% of the PSRC region, just as an abstract number, then some of your locations may not override other locations in the broader region. Trying to combine them all into a single map, if agencies are willing to share like a shape file or something, just pop them out, it'd be really interesting just to see what it looks like. It'd be really curious to see how much overlap there is. We just start getting the kind of the spaghetti of where you know, every local roadway is a different color, this city, this city, this city, based on kind of local concerns. But it'd be an interesting exercise if agencies were willing to share and that was easily accessible. Great. Thank you. Um, and I see we have uh, David um, Bergesser, if, if you, I think you were first, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, I think just echoing, uh, you know, a few of uh, Lacey Jane's comments, but, um, you know, I just wanted to call out, you know, it's really interesting to see, you know, the different methodologies that are used for different high injury networks kind of across the region. Um, and, you know, that some jurisdictions are incorporating risk factors into those. So, you know, as we map out our high injury network, you know, we kind of uh, think about that primarily as kind of the reactive side of our of our safety program of looking at you know where have crashes happened, where are we seeing injuries, serious injuries and fatalities happen, um, and I think that's a really important component of you know how we kind of take that initial look at safety. Um, but you know we're you know at the city of Seattle, you know we're also bringing in um, you know separate maps of looking at you know where are we seeing the highest speeds on our roadway and where are we seeing those risk factors happen. Um, so I know it's, you know, there's a lot of ways to kind of look at these networks and a lot of ways we can kind of bring in those different factors into the analysis. But I think, you know, just moving forward, um, you know, some way that we can, you know, kind of integrate those, those local analyses that we're doing, um, you know, kind of on the, on the city or county scale. Um, and also, um, you know, talking about more about, you know, should that kind of be inclu included in the regional analysis as well. Great, thank you, David. Um, and then it looks like David Payne with Kent, you uh, have your hand raised. David Cho. Oh, hey. Um, yeah, so I'd also, it's a discussion point. Um, yeah, we, in our conversations with PSRC, thank you all again for sharing, you know, the draft high injury network uh, ahead of time while we're working through our draft high injury network, and they're they're a little different, right? Uh, that was actually something that we felt much more comfortable uh, understanding that PSRC has a slightly different methodology and then we could explain that and describe why since this is a locally based <laughs> um you know safe streets and roads for all target zero action plan that's part of the buy-in uh our race and equity office representatives you know they 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 kind of push back a little bit on the idea of having one map to rule them all if you will um so just wanted to, to put that plug in thanks again great um it doesn't look like we have any other questions um, or thoughts from the attendees, but I guess I wanted to turn it over Kelly do you, or and Craig and Ben. Do you have any any thought? Want to share your thoughts on sort of the consistency across the region and based on what you've been hearing? Sure, maybe maybe I'll start. I think you know, as we've been discussing, we are the regional body. We we will always bump up into this 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 issue of we do things at a regional scale, we can't track every single roadway in every jurisdiction. So there's always going to be that distinction between the, the regional scale and local scale, regional planning and local planning. Um, and I also uh, just kind of adding a, a, another little flavor. This is the first time that we are all doing this work. This is our first regional safety action plan. We are still in the thick of it um, as, as Andrew and, and Mike has been uh, sharing the high injury network is the kind of foundational data piece. And then we move on and look at the causal, the contributing factors and the strategies and the rest of it. So I think this is gonna to continue to evolve and play through. Um, we also know that local jurisdictions, some of you have existing safety plans. Some of you are working on them. Some of, the, some of you might be doing other things. So it's not that we have local high injury networks in place right now but as we i think our commitment is as these come through and as all of this work evolves both at our scale and your scale we are committed to um we're happy to sit down with folks and and talk further about the the consistency approach i think david you said it beautifully there is going to it's it is okay that we are um there might be distinctions between the regional and local scale. And I think Andrew laid out, you know, what the purpose of the high injury network is. But I think as your local plans and your local high injury networks come into play, let's have that conversation and let's just kind of do that cross check. And 
again, I think we'll never have one map that shows every local uh, area, but we can continue to have that conversation about how we reference, how we incorporate, how we how we can support that. So, but we're we're in the beginning and we're all moving on this journey together. So, Craig, I see Craig and Ben both have their mics off as well. I was going to try to add something, but I think you said everything I would say, Kelly. So um, I would just reiterate that thing is like we would never assume at the regional level we're going to have the same thing that's going to exist at the local level, right? That happens in everything we do because you have a lot more detail. Like we have a regional network that's generally principal arterials and above. We have minor arterials or transon, but that that's a good example, right? We're never going to have anything below a minor arterial show up on our data uh, on our high entry network because that's just not our regional network. Um, having said that, that doesn't mean that's why one of the things we see from the data side is we also want to make um, the data easy and available for people to get. So all of the data and information that's behind the work we're doing, we want to make readily available for everybody else as well. So. The only thing I, I'd add, and I agree with, with both what Kelly and Craig said, is that the important thing here is that we're all approaching um, looking at roadways um, through a data-driven process that have me methodologies that may, while they differ in some of the choices made, they're consistent in general approach. And that's the purpose. That's the purpose of a regional, one of the purposes of a regional plan is to foster and sort of support this regional culture of, of safety that looks at roadways at different scales and for slightly different purposes. But, and also that there, while there are jurisdictions, um, larger jurisdictions that have the staff capacity to um, do the localized analysis, many of our jurisdictions really may not have that capability. And so as Craig mentioned, making a, a regional um, data set available can can be of assistance. But um, yeah, what, again, to reiterate, first, first go at this and we'll see how um, what, once we, we can look at them all together and see where we may refine our approach in the future. Um, it's just great to learn from one another and to know that we're all approaching this in the same way. Yeah, this is really the, the beginning of the conversation in some ways. So, um, Carrie, I see you have a question. Yeah, I'll try to, I'll keep it quick. So Carrie Wilhelm, City of Tacoma, we have an established Vision Zero plan that identifies a high-risk network. And so just, um, you know, I think the heart of some of our wondering is the fact PSRC doesn't own or maintain any of these streets. And so really, you know, a big part is funding and money. So I think an additional conversation would be to, you know, understand how PSRC is going to be using this map from a funding and prioritization of funding standpoint. And you don't have to answer that now, but I know that's a lot of uh, people's wonderings. And then also you're saying about for those who have established um, maps, um, have a conversation. So is the next step then that we would reach out, like the city of Tacoma would reach out and ask for a meeting to talk about how we did risk and how we've been using it? Or is there going to be a follow-up meeting like this where you kind of bring everybody together again to kind of start doing a facilitated conversation that way? So wondering if we reach out to you or if there's a next step of you reaching out to all of us. Thank you. Um, Kelly, do you wanna take this? Or? Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. I will Very set good. aside the funding one because that is still ongoing conversations that our board will determine, but that is a great question that we, to be honest, we hadn't really talked through. So we wanted to kind of start with this conversation and understand what, what the uh, concerns about regional versus local consistency might be, but I really like what you suggested because we don't know what's out there. We know some what some jurisdictions are doing, but we don't know what everyone is doing. So um, maybe what we can do, Gary, is send a follow up to this workshop to say anyone who would like to discuss further at this point, let's set up a meeting and, and do that. It yeah. might be I don't want to speak for the team because I know we're in the thick of getting this this document ready to be released for public comment. So. That might be an ongoing conversation and maybe not an immediate conversation, but that that might be the, the best approach is we do a call out to say, hey, who's doing what? And let's start scheduling some some meetings to discuss further. Uh, team, does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Great suggestion, Carrie. Thank you. Great. Well, we are at time. So um, I'd, I'd like to really thank everybody for joining today. I think this has been a great really beginning to this regional conversation. Um, 
regarding, um, you know, high injury networks and and our approaches. Um, as Kelly said, I think we we yeah, we are happy to have additional meetings going forward. We're going to assess everything as sort of as um, folks continue you know continue to develop their high injury networks, and as we begin to see. Um, what others are doing, um, we will determine sort of what the next steps are. Um, and like I said, if anybody has any more technical questions, uh, please feel free to email me um, and I'll make sure that we get those um, addressed. So is there anything else from anyone before we close out? Okay. Well, happy Friday, everybody. And uh, again, thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.